so thanks, Marty. Appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Frank Stonebanks. I'm the chairman and CEO of Renibus. Uh, Renibus is a clinical stage biotech focused on cardiorenal disease. And I'm going to spend about 15 minutes kind of giving you the overview of the story. Um, it's a pretty big story and a lot of big things are happening. And so I was appreciative that Marty reached out and the timing is very good for discussing this and our bridge financing that's uh, ongoing at the moment. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, before I do, just by way of background, you know, obviously, look, everybody has a great team, um, but I wanted to share this for a couple of different reasons. Not everybody has a great team that's actually had multiple multi-billion dollar exits, and we do. Uh, so personally, I've spent, you know, as Marty said, about 25 years working in the space as both an operator, kind of everyday job from sales to CEO. I've been a four-time biotech CEO, two-time founder, uh, also spent a lot of time in the venture space as a private equity guy and also uh, healthcare venture capital. Um, we just recruited or just signed on uh, Jamie Donatio as our CFO, and you can see his accolades there. He's raised billions for multiple companies. Um, as well as Dr. Bhupinder Singh, who's a nephrologist by training, has just come on as our CMO formerly, although he's been with the company for quite a while uh, in a variety of capacities, which I'll, I'll explain a little bit later. And he spent a lot of time both in private and public biotechs. Um, our two co-founders are Jeff Kieser, who's our COO, co-founder and president, um, both Jeff and Al Gillum. Uh, co-founded two companies that anybody uh, who has a lot of healthcare history may have remembered, uh, Adams Respiratory Therapeutics and ZS Pharma. Both of those products, both of those companies sold for north of two and a half billion over the last seven years uh, to big pharma. So we've got a group of people here that, uh, you know, know what they're doing and know how to build, run, uh, execute uh, and sell uh, businesses. So uh, what is Renibus and what are we kind of all about? So you kind of see an overview here. By the way, this is only gonna be about six or seven slides. And I wanna quickly get into any kind of Q&A and discussions. I know our time is short today. So we are a clinical stage, uh, private biotech company focused on changing the cardiorenal disease paradigm. We're based in South Lake, Texas. That's just outside of Fort Worth, about 10 minutes from the Fort Worth airport. We've got a strong pipeline of three different products covering a variety of cardiorenal areas. Uh, first of all, our lead product, RBT1 in post-op complications of cardiothoracic surgery. Our uh, second product tackles CKD or chronic kidney disease. And our third product tackles cisplatin-induced nephrotoxicity or when the kidneys get sick from chemotherapy. The science for the business basically comes out of the intellectual property comes out of the UW, University of Washington, Fred Hutch Cancer Center and Richard Zager's lab. And actually Richard runs our translational uh, lab at the moment, looking at both uh, optimizing our organic assets as well as looking at licensing opportunities. All three products are wholly owned by Renibus. Um, and so, you know, the value inflection story here is that for our uh, two products, RBT one and three, we essentially have two phase three ready products. We've tried to keep a very low profile. So you may not have heard of us and that's quite intentional from both the capital raising and a, and a PR perspective. Um, and from a near-term catalyst point of view, RBT1 has got a number of uh, things. So we've literally just come through a little bit of history. So the company was obviously formed in 2016 over the last six years, completed all the preclinical work for RBT1, completed all the phase one work. So that's three studies, product was safe. And we just completed a little less than a couple of weeks ago, an interim analysis on our first phase two study. This was a randomized controlled, placebo controlled, double blind study. Uh, in acute kidney injury and other complications post-cardiac post surgery. Essentially, RBT1, by the way, is a, a fixed combination product. It's an it's a IV drug uh, therapeutic, uh, Stannis protoporphyrin, which is essentially the, the muscle part of the hemoglobin molecule together with our proprietary version of iron sucrose together. And when those two things work together, they work to uh, interrupt uh, portions of the NERF2 pathway, which is a major vascular pathway um, in the body. So we completed this study, as I said, a couple, uh, or the interim analysis, sorry, a couple of weeks ago. We have far exceeded our primary endpoint, statistically significant results, both in the primary as well as in multiple secondary endpoints that relate to clinical benefit. I don't have time to get into them all today. I will in a few slides, just a few. Uh, that relate to hospital readmissions, ICU days, intubation uh, in the ICU and so forth. So this product is having very significant 
clinical benefit and signal, even in an underpowered phase two study. We just had an end of phase two meeting confirmed with the agency. That'll be in later July, where we're gonna discuss our phase three registration plan. One of our other products is RBT3. So RBT3 uh, is actually half of RBT1. So it's the proprietary iron sucrose component of RBT1. And uh, we just literally got communication from the FDA that uh, we could be pending a bridging study in a 505B2 uh, phase three program by the end of the year. And that would be in, as I mentioned earlier, cisplatin induced nephrotoxicity. There's, there's literally 3 million patients a year who still get uh, cisplatin. A lot of those, but more than a third of those folks have a DLTs, dose limiting toxicities due to that chemo. Uh, we've shown preclinically that our product can prevent upwards of 50% of that toxicity. So we're excited about studying this product in that space. And last but not least, RBT9 uh, was the other component of RBT1. So that's the Stannis protoporphyrin component of RBT1. Before I joined the company about six months ago as the CEO, there was an ongoing phase two study, which we essentially uh, uh, brought to a strategic close. It was in COVID, this, study, this drug was studied because we've actually seen it has uh, uh, beneficial effects uh, as an antiviral, believe it or not. Uh, in an NIH panel of, of viruses. So like everybody <laughs> during the COVID years was studying their assets and what they could do with COVID. Um, and lo and behold, it actually dramatically reduced the hospitalization rates of these patients versus placebo almost by 70%. Look, we're not a COVID company, we're cardio renal biotech. So we're looking at potentially monetizing this uh, component or this, this asset to an infectious disease focused strategic pharma. As I said, the teams had a lot of success in terms of exits and the like, so I won't dwell on that point. Uh, here's another way to look at the pipeline, so you can sort of see where we are uh, across the board. RBT1, uh, we'll be looking at a phase three program in prevention of post-op complications following cardiothoracic surgery. We just got our interim data, uh, and we have an FDA meeting coming up in the next uh, month and a half or so. Uh, RBT3, I just finished talking through uh, in terms of the program there. And RBT2 is our earliest compound, uh, and that is a, uh, a, a proprietary derivative of the curcumin molecule. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of preclinical data that's very exciting in delaying the progression of early stage kidney disease to late stage. This is called CKD or chronic kidney disease. We're currently formulating this product. We'll be in the clinic uh, by the first quarter of next year. And this is really much more for pharma partner audiences. So I apologize for leaving it on here today, but um, th this is really other areas where RBT1 could potentially play outside of our current phase two slash three uh, initial strategy. It's, it's got a broad organ protective capability. We really saw that data come through shiningly in the phase two analysis, the interim analysis. So from a pharma partner perspective or acquirer perspective, they're quite excited about some of these other areas, including uh, NASH. We do have preclinical data showing compelling activity, uh, protective activity in the liver. Uh, this is just a quick summary again of the programs and the financing of the company. So as I mentioned, RBT1 is essentially phase three ready post this FDA meeting in July. We will continue the phase two study until completion, even though we did the interim analysis. Uh, we were encouraged to do so based on uh, initial feedback uh, with the agency. Uh, I just talked about RBT2 and kind of where that's heading, as well as RBT3, which we expect will be, again, in phase three in a 505B2 model uh, later this year. We would be the only product with a, uh, potentially with a prevention claim uh, looking at cisplatin-induced nephrotoxicity. From a financing perspective, the company is run very lean and mean. As I said, founded in 2016, we, we closed a $15 million extension of a total $35 million Series A at the end of January. Uh, the post money on that round was about 75 million. It's actually about 80 million if you add in the, uh, the option pool. And where we are today, uh, sort of looking forward again, the possibility of having two compounds in phase three by the end of this year between RBT1 and RBT3. We're, I'm, coming, I'm gonna come back to the bridge financing uh, ask in a second, but we are looking through to September, uh, even as we speak, we're in diligence, technical diligence with a number of institutional investors looking at a $75 million institutional B round to close at the end of September. But prior to that, 
we actually want to do a near-term uh, equity bridge financing. I'll come back to one second on some of the nice pops on the phase two data that I wanna show you. Um, so for the bridge financing, again, this is looking at the next several months. We've got about nine months of cash at the moment. We're raising target raise of 10 to 20 million. Uh, closed by the uh, by July 15th. There's already a, a tremendous amount of interest. I'll just be very straight with everybody. A tremendous amount of interest in this um, bridge because we're basically already in discussions with a number of institutional investors. The target audience for this is our current investor base, also select new family offices investors uh, and the like. And for us, the strategic rationale is pretty simple. It really just provides the company maximum flexibility going into the B round uh, institutional raise. Uh, in September, as it relates to things like valuation, also timing with the FDA and those discussions and the like, uh, and some flexibility around the phase three start for RBT3. Uh, it's a safe structure. I'm sure everybody's familiar with this approach. Um, and the benefit for bridge investors like yourselves, I think, to consider this is that this, you'll really be, or you are, the, really the first ones to, to come into the deal and be the first to see this phase two uh, data from RBT1 and come in, frankly, on very favorable terms prior to the institutional round, who obviously will set the pre-money <clears throat> pre -money at that point. There'll be some discount. We haven't yet announced what that's gonna be. Uh, but again, uh, if anyone's interested in uh, that, they can certainly follow up with me directly and my contact info is there. I'll leave it up on the screen in one second. But I do wanna go back to um, this slide just to show you a little, a uh, few nuggets. Uh, of uh, data from the interim analysis um, that we just came out of. Here are the headlines. So we did see that RBT1 provided a sustained organ protective effect across the board. It was well tolerated. We produced a highly statistically significant. The p-value was something like 11 zeros and a one. So I won't bore you, but it's three zeros and a one here. Um, in terms of our primary efficacy a primary endpoint, and that's with regards to clinically relevant biomarkers, uh, these three here. So hemoxygenase, IL-10, and ferritin, which really va validates for us the translation of the initial pharmacology and phase one data uh, into the target patient population. We also saw statistically significant reductions in the normalization of creatinine and EGFR um, at 30 days, uh, obviously indicating a sustained renal protective effect. Uh, we also had statistically significant uh, outcomes in clinical uh, benefit parameters, including reduction in ventilator days, ICU days, and 30-day 30 uh, 30-day uh, hospital readmission rates. Remember, this was a study not powered to show this. Okay, this was a 126 patient study. This was an interim cut at 60, and even at the interim cut, we still showed significance in secondary endpoints. So I think that's surprising. Frankly, we were surprised, to be honest. Um, but the power of that, I think, is very uh, useful, important to recall. Um, we are, as I said, in discussions with the agency on the phase three program. We will be applying for breakthrough, fast track, et cetera, meeting with the agency in later July. So just to summarize, and I'll kind of leave us, I think, on this screen. Um, again, we've got uh, a series of products that have uh, multi-billion dollar potential. Uh, and I, I know probably every operating CEO says that to you, and I've been a four-time CEO, but you know, in this case, <laughs> this, is, this is really true. <laughs> so uh, this is an unbelievable situation where we got so much more out of this, this interim analysis than we were expecting. Frankly, we were expecting to go into a phase three program and acute kidney injury and be very narrow and be very focused. And we saw all this organ protective data come out. Uh, from a clinical benefit perspective, and frankly, everybody was surprised, our entire clinical team, the CMO, et cetera. So, um, you know, tremendous potential here. Uh, again, you see sort of the, the key milestones uh, summarized here on the right, which I've kind of already talked about and talked through. So I think in the, in the interest of time and maybe getting in some Q&A before, so I know you're on a tight schedule, Marty, I'll, I'll probably close there and I, I'd be happy to take any questions. I'll leave my contact info up for folks. Uh, great, actually. So uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, otherwise, I, I have uh, a question. So, so Frank, uh, can you talk about the economics of this? Like, who are the main competitors in the space right now? Is, is, is this product paid for by insurance? How much do people pay for it via, you know, what's, what's the sure. insurance reimbursement on that? 
you yeah. know, et cetera, et cetera? Like, yeah, sure. It, what's the economics? Yeah, sure. So great question. So basically uh, on the competition side, there's really nobody in this space. So even in the prevention of acute kidney injury space in hospitalized patients post cardiac surgery, there's really only one competitor and they're like two years behind us. But now I'm already after getting this interim data that we got, and, and the broad organ protective effect that we see, we're gonna go into a phase three study where the label is gonna say something like prevention of post-operative complications following cardiothoracic surgery, because based on the phase two data, we, we can shoot for that. And so we'll know more obviously after our discussions with the agency, but that is exactly what we're gonna so, go So for. the question was, how, how do they make money? How do you make money? So we make money by charging a very high premium price. This is going to be a hospital-based product. This is not going to be a wide-scale used product. This will be a product used in the hospital environment. So this will be a very, very, very premium-based product based on the clinical benefit that it confers, at least based on the phase two data so far. So are we hospital, talking like- are we And, talking and the like, hospital, um, and just let me just finish one second. So the hospital will clearly make money because they're getting patients off intubation quicker, out of the ICU faster. A day in the ICU costs $15,000. You get person out of the ICU one day faster. That's a tremendous impact on the overall model. So, so, so you think you know you're going to charge five thousand dollars for this? Really, product? too early to say. Yeah, because we're just embarking on our phase three program, so it would be very premature for me to speculate on a, on an ASP at this is, point. Is it likely exit an IPO, reverse merger? Likely exit is an likely exit is an acquisition. Eighty percent of businesses in our space are acquired. Uh, this is a portfolio, quite frankly, that's ripe for being bought. You know, if I was to forecast something, I would say that we're much more likely to be acquired than we are to go public. Although, obviously, we would dual track and all the rest of it. The, the tech giants are are kind of crammed down right now, so their ability to acquire is is hampered. But I, I don't know about the healthcare giants. Yeah, already. very different story on the pharma side. So, pharma companies are majorly flush with cash. Um, and you know, th their, their pain point is lack of innovation, which is what we provide. They have a lot sure. of their cash generating machines. They have, don't have a lot of innovation. We have a lot of innovation, but we need cash. So that's the marriage, right. That we, we get to. Yep. Yep.